Power is a word that uh, Americans are just very uncomfortable with. Now, I must say that we know it. We know that there's the other side of the tracks and there's the people that live in the nice houses. We have all of these euphemisms that we use for uh, power structures and for social classes. I think that there very definitely is an upper class in the United States and indeed that's been the starting point of my research. If a group is a, a dominant group or a ruling group, we would expect them to have more of what uh, people value in a society. And certainly this uh, upper social class we've been talking about has more wealth, it has more income, uh, it certainly has access to the best, best education and health care and so on. So on all the measures of who benefits, uh, I think there's, that shows that they are a ruling class. There is what I call a corporate community, which means that the large corporations in America are interconnected through ownership, through sharing of information, through putting out products together, uh, through having the same directors, uh, through uh, hiring each other's managers, that it truly is, in that sense, a community. This is where we get back to this question about, is there a power structure? Americans are used to thinking, well, if there's a power structure, we wouldn't even be allowed to be in politics. But in America, you're allowed to run for president. You can run for anything you want. There's just one thing. You better have several million dollars or access to people that, that have several million dollars. So you see, we can say on the one hand, well, it's very fair, anybody can run, but in fact, not anybody can when you get down to the specifics of the matter. So we have a formally open and liberal system, but in practice, the way things work out is that the rich get richer uh, and they are able to continue a set of policies that, uh, that maximize their advantages. We're going to find out who rules America with the country's foremost expert, right now on Alternative Views. If there's one subject that you will not see on the traditional media, particularly television, it's something about the American power structure. Who has power? Who benefits from this? Who controls things, influences things? Well, we have the man with us tonight who knows more about power than anybody else in the country. You may know him by the name of G. William Domhoff from a lot of his books. The first uh, book which he came out with, as far as I know, was C. Wright Mills and the Power Elite. C. Wright w Mills was the first one to come up with a comprehensive look at power in the United States in 1956. And then uh, Bill's first big book, comprehensive book, was Who Rules America, which has been read by many, many people, and others such as The Bohemian Grove, The Higher Circles, The Powers That Be, and the most recent one, Who Rules America Now? If you want to find out just who does rule America, and it ain't you and I, well, you re want to read that book. I want to, uh, Bill, ask you his first question by using a quote from C. Wright Mills in his book, Power Elite, or some other book. He said, if, you, if somebody starts talking about power and the use of power, you're automatically a muckraker. Right. Uh, <laughs> power is a word that uh, Americans are just very uncomfortable with. We, we're willing to talk about influence, and what we basically like to believe is that individuals and groups can join together 
uh, to influence specific issues. But power is something that happens in Europe. It's, it's part of the whole American experience to put no emphasis upon the idea of social class and to put no emphasis on the idea of power. Why do you think this is? I think that it comes out of, uh, out of the uh, classic liberal tradition and out of American history of rebelling against the, uh, the uh, king in, in, in the American Revolution. But, and then from there, I think it's because the American experience has been s seemingly very individualistic. That is, people have moved across the country. There is evidence of upward mobility. Uh, people have become uh, wealthy. They have been able to get education and change their station in life a little bit. Um, and I think that then reinforces this kind of, of belief. So that the idea that there is a power structure and a social structure is then something that, um, that we, w we want to ignore. Now, I must say that we know it. We know that there's the other side of the tracks and there's the people that live in the nice houses. We have all of these euphemisms that we use for uh, power structures and for social classes. What is the dominant view in the universities in the United States mm -hmm. of what you call the power structure? I think the dominant view in, uh, in the university is something we call pluralism, which says that uh, influence in the United States is exercised by specific individuals who come together as a coalition or an interest group to work on one particular kind of issue. So we always stay at the level of individuals and groups, and we never talk in terms of long-standing institutional structures, which sounds pretty abstract, but that gets down to things like corporations or foundations that for 60 or 80 years have been giving out great amount of money to, to influence directions that uh, policy take. I think that whole, that whole kind of level drops out of our thinking, and, and I think that our educational system does reinforce that. And what led you to take this different approach to power? Why did you become dissatisfied with the pluralist approach and start looking at the power structure in different terms? I think that uh, for me it, it was probably because of many of the events of the 1960s when people tried to uh, exercise their rights, such as in the civil rights movement, or such as in the um, uh, anti-war movement of the time, or even in some of the attempts by consumer advocates, such as Ralph Nader. Uh, basically, when when they seem to be meeting a stone wall, then you kind of uh, uh, think there may be something else more there. I like what Ralph Nader said in, in regard to uh, in, in regard to your question. That he says said is that if you want to find out about the power structure, you got to go out there and kind of bump up against it. Uh, the way you find it's there is when you hit these brick walls. And uh, uh, as I saw that happening, I, I got more interested in uh, trying to see if there was this class and institutional structure. And basically, I started out in, a, I think, a good old American way by trying to trace individuals in their, in, their, um, um, in their activities. And what I found standing behind these individuals, I believe, are Lord, large corporations, large foundations, a series of research institutes, a series of policy discussion groups that make it so that a David Rockefeller uh, is not merely an individual, but is, in fact, constantly um, involved, whether it's with a bank or his foundation or policy discussion group like the Council on Foreign Relations, and then one begins to see that there's an ongoing institutional structure. And so that even then when David Rockefeller retires, you see that the people that now run Chase Manhattan Bank, that now are the directors of the Council on Foreign Relations, continue to be the people that run uh, uh, the country. So that uh, when you get a little time perspective on it, you start to see the individuals change a little bit, but that they come from the same social background and they come from the same large uh, institutions. So I tried then to find that uh, structure that stood behind our uh, individual actions. Well, let's take a look at this. And for I guess we should start with the class, the class structure and class nature of the United States. Now, we hear about middle class very frequently. It's written, a lot of things are studied about the middle class, and a lot of things have been written about the middle class. You see frequently lower middle class and lower, 
but you don't see too much written about upper class. Now, if there's a middle class, there has to be an upper, right? Okay. I think that there very definitely is an upper class in the United States, and indeed, that's been the starting point of my research, is to start with uh, social clubs, exclusive private schools, summer resorts, to start with what uh, uh, we can see if we will but look, uh, to see these people as a set of interacting and intermarrying a set of families who have developed a whole set of uh, social institutions that preserve their way of life. Once we have located these various schools, clubs, resorts, retreats, debutante balls, then we can understand uh, the uh, historical continuity of uh, social upper class in America. It's my belief that uh, about uh, half a percent of Americans are part of what I would call a social upper class. Uh, and these people uh, own about 20 to 25 percent of all the privately held wealth in the United States. That is, if we took all of your wealth, which might be your car, your house, your insurance policy, if we threw in your guitar, uh, everything, <laughs> we took all of that wealth plus the stocks and bonds and real estate in America, we put all that in a big pile, 20 to 25 percent of all of that one half of one percent of the people have that in the United States. And what my thesis basically says is that those people that have that 20 to 25 percent of all the privately held wealth are not mere individuals that are scattered here and there and are kind of rare and don't know each other, but in fact they uh, uh, are, are closely knit. They know each other, they see the world the same way, they do discuss with each other, uh, the kinds of policies that they think uh, would uh, further their way of life. So in that sense, we then talk about them um, in this more sociological abstract sense that uh, they're not just families, because in fact, there, there are these ongoing institutional uh, kinds of structures, and they are uh, uh, structures that do matter, and they make a difference to a lot of Americans uh, as they attempt to emulate these people, as they attempt to become part of these uh, institutions and so on. Now, Andrew, this their uh, institutions and their structures do uh, two things, or three. They First, they perpetuate themselves. They exclude other people. They have mechanisms to exclude other people from joining them. Absolutely. And But they also, they use the mechanisms to bring up new blood when they think these people have the right credentials and the right, I think uh, one of the most dramatic examples that I know of that Frank concerns the way in which uh, moderate uh, members of the upper class responded to the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s and the uh, rebellions that were going on in the inner cities in the ghettos at that time, and that was that a number of these institutions of which we're talking decided that. Uh, they really had to find the best and the brightest of the black community and to educate them so they could be uh, more a part of the, of the corporate structure. And what they simply did was to get money from the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations and a couple others, and then to go to leading private schools and say, we want to create a scholarship program for black students. And this program is called ABC, A Better Chance. And literally, over the space then of 10 or 15 years, uh, many thousands of young black students were taken into these prep schools and then from there went on to major colleges and universities with fellowships. And these people are now out there in their 30s, uh, being uh, in the media, being in corporate law, working for uh, corporations. We've interviewed some of these people, and it's very fascinating the way, in, and it shows you so nicely about class, because these people gradually take on the style and manner of the school of which they were a part. And they, they tell us, it's very funny, that they'll go home and people say, you're starting to talk different. Mm -hmm. you're, and, and they say, you know, it's, I go and I like to visit my family, but my other friends, I don't have anything in common with them anymore. And that's what we mean you see by then a social class. If, if one has read all about uh, American history and knows about various kinds of, uh, of arts that most people don't know about, if you've had European vacations, um, then you want to talk to other people that can talk your language. Uh, and, and gradually then these people come to feel different 
from the very uh, group that they originally came from. I use this example because I think it is so dramatic in the sense that we're taking very poor people uh, out, of, out of the ghetto and taking them to this private school where they're one of two or three or four black people. At what age, by the way? Oh, 14, 15, 16. Uh -huh. and, uh, and making them part of this class in the sense of putting them there and then, and then they gradually, just out of human processes of while you're at school, you certainly want to relate to other people, you want to get along, and before you know it, you're like the people that uh, that uh, you're going to school with. It's socialization. I mean, that's right, the process. Exactly. Are these people uh, intermarrying with their white social cl uh, social upper class people, or do they bring black women into this there program are, as well? There are black women in the program as well, um, and I don't know the answer to that question in terms of any systematic data yet. We've only interviewed a few mm -hmm. of the people, but definitely then there is uh, some intermarriage. I guess the next big question then, there is this upper class in the United States. Is it a ruling class, a governing class? And is it cohesive? Yeah, I, I, I believe that uh, first it is cohesive and, and secondly that uh, it is a ruling class. I think that we see the cohesion in the fact that uh, these people are members of each other's clubs, so to speak. That is, if we look at club memberships all over the United States, we would find that uh, a leading banker in New York may well be in clubs in Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. We find in the case of a club I've studied with uh, some care called the Bohemian Club in San Francisco that people from all of the United States come to its two-week retreat in the last uh, part of July and uh, sleep together in tents and huts and teepees and just kind of go to summer camp together. They literally do go to, to uh, summer camp uh, together. There's a lot of that kind of social cohesiveness. There's also cohesiveness in the corporate world in that they sit on each other's corporate boards. So that uh, the head of Chase Manhattan Bank, such as David Rockefeller until recent years, will sit on two or three other corporation boards. But the head of those corporations will also sit on the board of Chase Manhattan Bank. So they take in each other's laundry at the economic uh, uh, level as well. They also come together to talk about more general issues whether it's uh, foreign policy or kinds of domestic policy, at what I call discussion groups. But this means organizations like the Committee for Economic Development, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Conference Board, the Business Council. Uh, there's numerous of these groups. So I think there is cohesiveness uh, in this uh, group as a social class and, as, and in terms of its economic interest. We've been talking a lot or referring to the Council on Foreign Relations, Committee for Economic Development, Trilateral Commission. Let's talk in greater detail about the policy planning mechanisms, some of these organizations mm -hmm. that we've been talking about, because I think this is probably the thing that people know least about. Mm -hmm. You don't find them in history books, yeah. and you don't find them in economics textbooks and all. Mm -hmm. Tell us about these. Basically, these, were, uh, these organizations were all created at different times in the 20th century in the face of particular problems that were faced by, by the, the corporate crack. community. Mm -hmm. In the case of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, it was formed shortly after World War I when uh, uh, states people came and corporate leaders came back from Versailles. And they said, we have to have a better perspective on foreign relations now that we're clearly going to be the dominant power in the world. And they created this discussion group in order to make themselves more sophisticated about these issues. These, these organizations are funded by large corporations and by foundations. They then bring together these business people for discussions with academic experts. These academic experts are basically housed at institutes on major campuses, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, Berkeley, MIT, Caltech, Nexus. And these experts are also housed at think tanks like the uh, Rand Corporation and various institutes for strategic thinking here, there, and everywhere. So what we have at a policy discussion group is the bringing together of a variety of academic opinions with this range of corporate leaders. And they then discuss a particular issue, as I say, a foreign policy issue, a monetary policy issue, a particular domestic issue. And they try to work out ideas that make sense to all of them. Now, from the corporate point of view, 
by listening, say they got a liberal academic and a more conservative academic in the same room, and they listen to you guys argue. And then they see what makes sense in terms of their, their view. view of the world. And interest, economic right. and social. Right. So I might then, so then in that situation, now, beyond then becoming sophisticated about policies, they also, you see, are looking at each other in terms of who can do this more general kind of task, meaning this, and I think we've all seen it in our lives. We have friends that might be very good at their particular job. They might be very good, say, at, at running a business. But if you ask them to do a more general thing, like be on the city council, they maybe don't do very well because they don't relate well to other groups. We see this with faculty people. People that do a fine job in their department, but maybe they would, you wouldn't want them on a general committee of the faculty because they, they're impatient with student demands or they get angry with the administration. So we say, we don't want to put that person on that mm -hmm. committee. So what they do is informally learn about each other's leadership capability. But what I, that's one thing that's learned at these organizations. But the other thing that's learned is which academic expert makes sense to me and can I personally relate to? So it's at these organizations that you meet somebody like a Henry Kissinger and you say, he not only makes sense, but I get along with him personally. So you develop then this, this relationship between the corporate community and, and the expert community at these organizations. So they are a place where these people get a more general view, where they get sophisticated, where they informally select each other as leaders, where they inject academic opinion into their, into their perspectives, where they uh, look academic experts over to become potential advisors in the government. And then, and very importantly, what these organizations do is they legitimate these people as fair-minded experts. You see, the interesting thing about politics in America in terms of policies as opposed to electing individuals is that the po political organizations of the ruling class are not called political. Now, this seems, uh, is this an irony? Yeah, in a way. That is, all the groups in America that are called nonpartisan, bipartisan, nonpolitical, that's the political organization <laughs> of the ruling class in America. You see, if you go out and say, I don't understand how you can talk about a ruling class. There's the Democrats over here and there's the Republicans over here. That's politics, isn't it? No, that's just deciding which individuals will fill offices. Politics in the important sense of, of which policies we all agree are, make sense, that happens in non-political organizations. So when uh, the Committee for Economic Development puts out a statement, it says, Committee for Economic Development, a nonpartisan group of <laughs> yeah. business people, today suggested we alter the Social Security system in the following way. S and then they say, look, some of our members are Democrats, some of our members are Republicans. We're trying to get something that's good for all of America. We're trying to transcend politics. We're trying to do something that's, that's in the national interest. Now, once you say, yeah, that's fair, we've got to get beyond this fight between Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> they're, they're, they're people that have, they can run an organization, their success in America. And then we identify with them because of their high status and, and because they're part of this fair-minded organization. Academic experts from Har Harvard have helped them and from Yale. And who are we, you know, to, to argue with somebody from Harvard and Yale, plus a successful business leader? And that's what we call legitimation. Uh, in, in my mind, of, of their policies. And we respect them. I know that because I, when I go around and, and talk about these things or debate these things and so on, many times people will stand up afterwards and they'll say, hey, who, why shouldn't uh, the man from General Motors run the country? He's a winner. Uh, he's shown, uh, like Iacocca, they're talking about Iacocca should be president, right? Mm -hmm. well, look at him. He's a wonderful guy. He's proven it. He's, he's run these corporations. What do you want for nothing? In other words, that's, that has made him somebody that Americans will, will accept and relate to, and, and they'll go along with those policies. So that's the a role, then, to come back to these organizations that they play, this kind of legitimation of policies that are in the general interest of the ruling class and are labeled uh, uh, nonpartisan. And then these policies not only are put into effect, but also the people from these organizations are placed in positions of decision-making power in the government. Right. And I think that the policies, incidentally, to be a little academic about it, I think that the policies could be implemented without necessarily putting the people in government. But it's the fact that the people that go into, gov go into government, that's what we can see most clearly. And that's mm -hmm. what people can kind of 
uh, can kind of relate to or identify with. They can see what you're talking about if you show the movement of Donald Reagan from Merrill Lynch to the business roundtable to government. And then if you say the same thing happens under Democrats, or if you show the movement of Henry Kissinger from Harvard to the Council on Foreign Relations to the paid staff of Nelson Rockefeller, and then finally to the government with, uh, under Nixon, then we can see that the, uh, what's happening. It might be that a lot of times that, that important policies come out of these organizations without necessarily the particular person coming to government. Uh, incidentally, where, to put this then at the level of persons again, from the point of view of these academic experts, what they're trying to do is to attach themselves to somebody that they think is going to be successful. Because the culmination of, of an academic expert's career is to be a Henry K Kissinger. And, he, and when I say that, I'm thinking of Brzezinski. Brzezinski was always sort of in the shadow of Kissinger. But he was always in these discussion groups I'm talking about. He headed an important think tank at Columbia, and he was always in Council on Foreign Relations Study Group. Well, David Rockefeller asked Brzezinski to head up the staff for this organization called the Trilateral Commission, which is a discussion group of, of uh, prominent leaders from the Western European nations plus Japan plus the United States. Incidentally, they're all people, all these countries have a Council on Foreign Relations, and they're basically people from the National Council on Foreign Relations. David Rockefeller asked Brzezinski to head this, uh, uh, the staff for this, this uh, new discussion group that started in the 70s. And when the man from Coca-Cola suggested to David Rockefeller that Jimmy Carter be a part of that group, Brzezinski met Carter at the, tri council, at the Trilateral Commission. Now, from Brzezinski's point of view, he looked and he said, this guy might make it to president. I'm going to bet on him, in effect. And the result will be I get to be a national security advisor someday. <laughs> so there is that whole subjective part of what the academic is doing there in terms of this is a guy I can relate to, and I think he's going to be a winner. So we could, I could explain all of, of, of what I've been talking about from a subjective careerist point of view for an individual like a Kissinger or a Brzezinski. But the, my point is, is he, a lot of them have bet on the wrong guy. That is, they decided they were going to work for George Romney. Well, who remembers George <laughs> Romney? You know? Or they decided they were going to uh, work for some particular Democrat that, that lost out somewhere, made a fatal faux pas. And uh, so we don't hear of them, but they probably maybe had some important policy inputs, but they themselves did not arrive in the government because they bet on the wrong political horse. So what this, these organizations do is to very much limit the range of policies that uh, are even that is even discussable. That's right. And they, what is legitimated in the uh, in the, the the minds of the American people, and also in Congress. That's right. But there's a parallel thing that goes on in public opinion shaping too, is there not? I think so. And I think the important thing to say is that is is precisely what you just did, and that is, it's not that these people sort of just pour opinions into our head, but rather that they try to manage the limits of respectable opinion, which are fairly wide as those things go in the world, but nonetheless, kinds of liberal opinions and kinds of ultra-conservative opinions get labeled in some way as too utopian or too kooky or un-American. And or too extreme or too yeah, radical. Right, and we can, like you know, you know the, the, the way the ultra-conservatives do it is to call it anti, you know, to call it communist or socialist <laughs> or un-American. The moderates say, sounds awfully utopian to me. Or it sounds awfully academic. <laughs> I mean, the, the appeal is to the practical. If we can legitimate something as practical and American, then it's okay. But very definitely, there's a constant argument that goes on to try to keep some opinions not respectable. And to see that, you have to look historically at some particular argument. And here I just say quickly that the best example of that involves uh, the famous economist John Maynard Keynes and his views about the use of government spending to, to stabilize a capitalist economy. There are many ways of being, there are many policies that follow from Keynes. There are many different things you could do and be a Keynesian. But what happened in America from 1935 to 1965 was essentially an intellectual struggle in which the business community was, saw that a very conservative Keynesianism would make sense to them, but that a more liberal Keynesianism uh, they didn't want. They didn't want to accept, and furthermore, weren't forced to accept because our working class 
is not powerful enough organizationally to force a liberal kind of Keynesianism such as happens in uh, uh, Sweden, say. So basically what, was, what Keynes said in the, the middle 30s slowly got whittled down in the, just the way you described, got whittled down, and so we have a, a, a very conservative kind of Keynesianism. And now, right now, in America, we are seeing the amazing thing, whether intentionally or not, we are seeing the amazing and complete application of Keynesian economics to the American economy by somebody who, A, totally rejects Keynes, and claims he's a supply sider, and C, doesn't understand economics, and this is Ronald Reagan. But what has happened is that we've just had a total Keynesian recovery in the United States, because the key thing in Keynes is you run a deficit and you do government spending. Now, that's what Ronald Reagan has done, but it's all, of course, been military spending, and we call it a military Keynesianism. Ronald Reagan is behaving as a Keynesian, even while saying he's not. And he may not know he's a Keynesian. I don't know with him. You I know, you never know. <laughs> so there, is, there are a whole set of mechanisms that legitimate some opinions and make other opinions seem far out or not worth studying. Bill, the, ma the mass media do this, too. My studies of the mass media, I find that once this policy has been set, that the media will follow up on this and you will not find any discussion on anything on the other side mm -hmm. of this yeah. preset agenda by these people you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or if it is discussed, it's highly criticized, but generally it's just ignored. Mm -hmm. isn't, there, yeah. isn't there one another aspect of determining whether a ruling class is uh, also a governing class? Uh, or the upper class is also a ruling class, and that is you have to look at where the decision makers come from mm -hmm. to see if the prime decision makers come from this ruling class or the people whom this ruling class is selected to right. work. I think that that's another very useful way of, of understanding about power uh, because it's the most visible to us. That is, we can watch people. We, may, we right now are not, we don't know what's being talked about and said usually at the National Security Council or in the uh, private meetings in the White House. But we sure do know who's there. And uh, to give you an example, if we take uh, the Secretary of Treasury uh, as a, an important position, and we look at um, uh, a few of them. For instance, under Kennedy, uh, who ran on a, uh, a, a platform of getting the country moving again, uh, we've got to get beyond this stodgy Republican establishment, and so on. And yet, when he was elected, the person he put in charge of Treasury was a man named C. Douglas Dillon, from a man worth several hundreds of millions of dollars, who from a major investment uh, uh, house in, uh, in New York. When we jump to Jimmy Carter, who was our populist, and uh, Hamilton Jordan uh, assured us that we were going to see new faces, uh, in fact, the person that we got as our Secretary of Treasury was a man named W. Michael Blumenthal, who was the head of Bendix Corporation, a trustee of the Council on Foreign Relations, a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development, a trustee of Princeton University, uh, and a member of the Trilateral Commission. And he becomes our Secretary of Treasury. Now, Ronald Reagan comes in, and he's going to get rid of the mess in Washington from a neoconservative <laughs> perspective. But our Secretary of Treasury is a man named Donald Reagan, or was. Uh, it was his first Secretary of Treasury, as you know. And, and Donald Reagan was from Merrill Lynch. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development. He was a trustee of the Business Roundtable. And what I'm saying, of course, with those examples is that uh, when we look at the cabinet-level appointments of the past 40 years, at the least, but we could go back further. But if we look at the last 40 years, that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, whether it's a populist or a neoconservative, whatever particular ticket they run on or ideology they run on in order to attract a coalition of voters, when they turn to the question of governing, when they turn to the question of how are they going to implement a set of policies, they do, as your question uh, suggests, they turn to the same group of people that have been uh, both made sophisticated about issues in these policy discussion groups and have been made legitimate in these policy discussion groups as having more than just the perspective of their particular corporation, but also that they are statespersons. That is, that they are people that look at the broader picture. Um, so the continuity of, of these people is very great. I also want to add to that, Frank, now that you got me kind of rolling on it, <laughs> is that this also involves experts in America. 
not just uh, uh, multi-millionaires and corporate executives, but very important experts are part of this uh, 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 power elite that we're talking about as well. And, and what I'm then saying is that, that councils on foreign relations, committees for economic development and so on, actually have basically a monopoly of the respectable expertise in the United States. The people that are sound and sensible. These are, are all in quotes, respectable, right. sound, sound. Henry sensible. Kissinger being one example. Yeah, and that's Kissinger exactly the where I'm headed sound. is to Henry Kissinger. Yeah. If we look at the career of Henry Kissinger, we, we might say, well, only in America. <laughs> uh, in one way, yes, because here is a person who's an escapee from, from uh, Nazi Germany who, by going to school here, by doing well at Harvard, we can say, look at him. He's been very important, and he has. But here is the other part of, of, of Kissinger's career that's so important. While he was at Harvard, he was uh, seen by a man named McGeorge Bundy, who was the dean of the faculty, or the head of the faculty, and uh, from a prominent Boston family. His father is a corporation lawyer. Uh, in other words, he's a well-to-do person uh, that happened to be in the academic world. And he called his friends at the Council on Foreign Relations and he said, you know, this guy Kissinger is a bright young guy and he could really be useful in some of the discussion groups. And so Kissinger was invited to be in these discussion groups and Nelson Rockefeller was really taken with Kissinger and he basically then hired him to write things for him and to write things for panels of experts that the Rockefellers set up. Well. In the late 60s, the interesting thing is that, of course, that Richard Nixon appointed Kissinger as his foreign policy advisor. Now, the first reason that's interesting is that supposedly Nixon and, Kiss and, and Rockefeller, excuse me, that Nixon and Rockefeller were so different, they had all their political conflicts, and yet Nixon was perfectly willing to hire what seemed to be, quotes, Nelson Rockefeller's man. But beyond that, the interesting thing is that uh, two years after the election, at a point when uh, Kissinger's star was, was quite high, uh, Hubert Humphrey was interviewed. Was ta they were talking about what he would have done if he was uh, uh, president. And he said, well, it's funny. He said, one of the things I was going to do was appoint Henry Kissinger. He had talked to Henry Kissinger before the election, saying, if I'm elected, will you be my foreign policy advisor? My point is, of course, whether we get Nixon or whether we get Humphrey, there was one thing we were sure we were going to get, and that was Kissinger. He was the Rockefeller man. Uh, yeah, from the but start. basically, by that time, of course, he's known to many of these corporate people. His expertise is very useful to them. Uh, he's been legitimated through being part of these organizations sure, like the council. But then let's take it down to, to what I think is uh, also interesting in terms of the continuity of, of a power structure. Let's take it down to the early 1980s. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, in part, ran on a platform that was practically running against Henry Kissinger. One of the things the very conservative Republicans do not like is what they call the Eastern Establishment, and one of their favorite pet peeves within the Eastern Establishment is the Council on Foreign Relations, and one part of that is Henry Kissinger. Well, what do we end up with, though? Within a year or two, we have Henry Kissinger as head of the President's Commission on Central America. In other words, Ronald Reagan also then hires Henry Kissinger. So when you just trace the career of that man, you then see the continuity in the power structure. But at the same time, we're back to our earlier point about, are we just talking about individuals? No, we're not, because we have to understand that Kissinger first was at a very important institution called Harvard, which is one of the main reservoirs of expertise, as well as a place for upward mobility, where uh, experts are seen by members of the ruling class, whether they're uh, McGeorge Bundy or whether they're trustees of the university. Then he went to the Council on Foreign Relations where he was part of a discussion group of 20 or 30 people from all over the country, people from the CIA, people from the State Department, people from corporations, people from law firms, other academic experts. And in that situation, he, they say, this person sees the world the way we do, and he has information that's, that's very useful to us. Uh, and so it's this institutional setting that he's moved through that brings him into uh, uh, the power structure. Bill, could we move now yeah. to the economic foundation okay. of this uh, power structure? Well, I think that, uh, in a simple phrase, they are the owners and managers of large corporations and banks. I think that the base of power there are two key bases of power in the United States. One is a large corporation, and the second 
is the uh, federal government in Washington. When I talk, for instance, about a Council on Foreign Relations, it's not, the Council on Foreign Relations is not a place of power. It is a place where powerful people discuss. When I talk about the Bohemian Club and its Bohemian Grove retreat in Northern California, the Bohemian Grove is not a place of power. You are not powerful because you are at the Bohemian Grove. You are at the Bohemian Grove because you are powerful. And you are powerful because you are an owner and manager of a large corporation. So that's the root of, of the power. Uh, in the United States. There is what I call a corporate community, which means that the large corporations in America are interconnected through ownership, through sharing of information, through putting out products together, uh, through having the same directors, uh, through uh, hiring each other's managers, that it truly is, in that sense, a community. Um, and, and they are relatively tightly knit. They, they not only share then a common interest in making a lot of money, but they also believe they have common enemies, which is very important in making a community too. And their common enemies are environmentalists, labor, and of course those dreadful bureaucrats in Washington who in the American ideology are constantly harassing these poor beleaguered entrepreneurs who are just struggling to to deliver jobs for us to make the third billion dollars yeah so i think then when we say when you see that they and we do know this from interviews that they see themselves constantly under pressure from as i say labor environmentalists and from government trying to regulate them that gives them a feeling of we against them but but more than that they're not just I don't just have you know one corporation and somebody else another one. We share that corporation. We have share it in ownership. We share it in directorship, uh, and so on. So I do think that is the base of, of power in the United States, uh, Doug, and that and that is something that people really don't like to to uh, say. That is, they they want to see power in individuals and not in General Motors and General Electric and uh, Exxon and and Chase Manhattan Bank. But actually, that's where I think the power is, then from there, people like Henry Kissinger become very important to articulate the general policies that those people need to uh, continue. The corporate community does develop a set of generalists. Maybe a person, maybe for instance, you start out running a particular corporation. You're doing a fine job. And you're asked to be on a couple or three other corporate boards. And from being on all those different corporate boards, you start to see the bigger picture. And now people say, Frank, would you go to Washington and testify and try to explain what, to these government officials what we need? You become a generalist for the corporations as a whole. And you may leave your particular job in any one corporation, but you're still part of the corporate community. You're not some individual floating around out there. You have an institutional base. You have a reference group in this uh, corporate community. That's right. Uh, so many people are from the Bechtel Corporation or in the Reagan administration, Secretary of State, mm -hmm. the Secretary of um, Defense, the Feds, right, right, and a right, couple right. of others. Yeah. And certainly they haven't lost their loyalty to the Bechtel Corporation. And the Bechtel Corporation yeah. is doing really well yeah. with the government contracts. Yeah. I want to ask you this. This seems like a contradiction in a way. In one hand, we say that the government is dominated or controlled by the wealthy, powerful people from the American ruling class. But on the other hand, we see that the business community grouses a lot about the bureaucrats in Washington now. Are they grousing and complaining about their own people and the way they run the government? Or are, is it like uh, a, a couple of books I've seen where it's the inside directors, the managers of these corporations who have basically their one corporation up, uppermost in mind, complaining about the way the, their upper, their betters, the ruling class in Washington is running the country for the benefit of themselves and the country. Mm -hmm. So you see this division at the absolutely highest level compared to the highest level of just merely one corporation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really complex and important question because it does seem to be an anomaly that businessmen say that they're powerless and yet they have all of this money, they're the ones appointed to government and so on. So why is it that businessmen 
say they are powerless. I've thought about that a lot and uh, uh, read a lot about it and I've interviewed people and I think that it has several levels to it as an answer. First of all, we have to come, we have to start with the fact that all Americans tend to have the the view that government is uh, awful and rapacious. It's like, that's what we always complain about. Uh, that's, that's just sort of the way we talk. For instance, in the Reagan administration, they're constantly talking against big government, constantly complaining about government, and yet they're constantly getting all of these subsidies and being, you know, using the government in ways that's useful to them. So, in one way, in one part of it, the answer is that it's, it's, it's just part of our rhetoric in America. But at the next level, and this uh, analysis comes from a political scientist who does not think there's a cohesive power lead, a man named Grant McConnell. He makes the point that by constantly criticizing these government officials, it keeps them on the defensive. You see, so it's a very good strategy if I walk in and I say, Doug, you're against me, aren't you? And they say, no, Bill, I'm not against you. Doug, you're always against me. You always seem to be not doing the stuff that really helps our corporation. This constant complaining about government keeps the government people kind of on the defensive and proving that they're all right. One of the best things that Kennedy ever did from the point of view of the business community was during his argument with uh, you, uh, the steel companies over, over the uh, over price rise that they did, uh, he made a comment to somebody, my father always told me businessmen were sons of bitches. Mm -hmm. Well, they constantly then used that on Kennedy, and he constantly had to prove <laughs> that he was okay. He and, right, and there's a wonderful book on, uh, on the free enterprisers that points out that uh, corporations did fantastically well under Kennedy. So it's, I think it's useful to do that. Now, but there's another level, and that is, you see, in the American government, the people that are the day-to-day -day employees do come from the, the middle levels of our society. The values of our country are such that it's no great individual fulfillment to become a government official because we look down on government so much. They're just politicians and bureaucrats. If this were uh, a European country with an aristocratic tradition, members of the upper class might say, gee, I think I'll go into the civil service, they would say and say, I'm thinking concretely here of England yeah. and of France, so that there might be many people in the government as permanent employees who were from the same class as the business people. But in America, that wouldn't be something you would do. If you had lots of money, you went to this nice prep school, now you've got this Yale degree, and you say, what am I going to do with my life? You're not going to say, oh, I'm going to go work for the government, unless it's the State Department. And there, there's some tradition of some upper class involvement. So they aren't part of the same networks. And in that sense, there's always the possibility that these government bureaucrats might, uh, we don't quite know them, so we don't maybe quite, you see, then trust them. There's that. There's also kind of residual level. idealism in the country at different times in history during the New Deal, during Kennedy in the 1960s. A lot of people were influenced to believe that we needed a stronger government, that the government should serve the mm -hmm. people. There's a populist tradition in the United States. And so some government, quote unquote, bureaucrats, we might say employees, have assimilated these beliefs That's that puts right. them in conflict with corporate power. There's also an anti-corporate tradition in the United States. That's it's right. not that everyone emulates and celebrates right. and goes along That's with the corporations. Right. Absolutely true. The reason I think your books have had impact in some quarters is because they have played to this distrust of excessive mm -hmm. corporate mm -hmm. power and so you get this at times operative in the government where there actually are conflicts I, between I the state and the government and there is a relative autonomy to some of the government regulatory uh, agencies, mostly they're packed by people from business right. sharing the interests of business yeah. but occasionally you'll get a Nicholas Johnson in the FCC, okay. who really believes that the media should be ruled in the uh, common interest and will go against right. the networks. So you get this kind of contradiction. I think you're absolutely US. right, and it's by looking precisely at cases like the one you just named, or if we looked at the Federal Trade Commission in the late, six, late 70s when Michael Perchek right. took it over, and he started to really use it to try to enforce various kinds of, of laws and regulations on the uh, 
corporations, and they fought back against the FCC. But, Doug, I think you're absolutely right, and I think that is the final level of, uh, of understanding uh, businessmen's concerns and feeling of powerlessness, and that's precisely the point that the, at, because Americans believe that government is uh, uh, potentially bad and domineering, and because of the populist democratic tradition of America, basically it says our government, you see, is founded on all the people. Governments in the past were founded on uh, divinities or uh, on kings, or the parliament founded a government, but ours clearly says power is in the people. And what that means is that in any American business person dominating that government, there's a certain way in which it's illegitimate. And the final point then that we think we pick up in interviews and, and, and uh, a couple of people have written about this, even for the 1920s, which we all assume was the heyday of business, there was always that fear that I think that you well put that namely the people might take over this government. So in that sense, it's not, it's not theirs in the legitimacy sense. And so there's always that concern with the underlying populist kind of thing. And it does manifest itself sometimes then in the, in the election of liberal people and, and, and then in the appointment of liberal officials. And, and you know, when, uh, when we were talking earlier about campaign finance and I was talking about people that rose to, to, to the heights in terms of running for president, running for vice president, uh, it's, it is also the case we can see it, we can all name some, that there are elected officials in the United States who are not part of the power elite. And they very often do oppose uh, uh, their positions. So I have no doubt there are pro-labor, there are pro-environmental, there are very liberal elected officials at, at various levels in our society, and that does create then real conflict. So that m uh, my, my point would be, it's not that there aren't such people there, my point is, they usually lose, just as you say, with, I mean, in effect, if we look at the FCC or if we look at the FTC, if we look at various kinds of attempts to create, for instance, a consumer protection agency with some teeth, OSHA, but what happens is OSHA we, OSHA, OSHA, OSHA that, we, that we eventually lose. They grind us down, and they grind us down because they have this institutional base behind them. They have more staying power, uh, and furthermore, eventually, with these liberal elected officials, they constantly run at these people. One of the things that's so interesting to me is to watch the way in which a liberal politician will come to Congress, and if he or she starts to really vote in a way that's constantly annoying to the business community, they will, quotes target that person. They will constantly send a lot of money to candidates that are running against this person in the district. So that keeping the person on the defensive, letting them know that one false step, and they're going to eliminate them. So, you see, my view is not of a power structure that's sort of sitting there and it's all signed, sealed, and delivered and never challenged. In America, the power structure is constantly challenged, but it basically constantly wins, except on, you know, occasionally it, it doesn't. But so, so there is real conflict in America, and I, I think your point really brings that out well. And, and uh, I, th I think that it's important not to deny that, what but it's important uh, to see who wins. That's, a, that's, the, that's the key to this, is that we do have a pluralistic society, but we do not have a pluralistic economic and political structure. I think that's excellent. I think that uh, we, I think we have the uh, paradox over the last 20 years that a lot of the social movements that have happened, a lot of the events have made in some way, in some ways this a very open society at the individual, personal, a uh, kind of level, mm -hmm. and yet I just continue to believe we have the same corporate power structure. And I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction in terms that, that uh, m my access to certain kinds of information, my right to do things as an individual, which is a very important part of liberalism, that that could be increased in the society, and it has been for, for minorities, for women, for gays, for handicapped. Uh, those kinds of liberal individual freedoms could actually be in some way increased, and we could still be relatively powerless. Mm -hmm. We will continue our discussion with William Domhoff on our next program. We'll discuss conflicts within the ruling class itself, and also how it handles the ferment and struggles of the people below. How much to concede, how much to repress. We'll also discuss the control of elections and politicians by the ruling class. And finally, we'll talk about local power structures, their particular interests, and their relationship to the national power structure. I thought I'd share with you this 
observation by sociologist C. Wright Mills, who was the first to study power comprehensively in the United States. Freedom is measured by the amount of control you have over the things upon which you are dependent. Well, thank you for watching Alternative Views. We'd like to thank our camera person, Eric Eubank, our audio man, Kevin L. West, and our assistant editor, Irene Heimer. And as we do every week, we wish to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV, for the use of their facilities. Alternative View 1-3. We're getting close to concluding our ninth year and starting our tenth. In producing Alternative Views, the program you've just seen is our 334th. And the program is viewed all over the country. We'd like to thank you for watching. Good night. No, but the most important issue is, is power, yeah. is control. Yeah, In other words, absolutely. if I'm going to make a few million dollars less for a few years, uh, okay. But I want to keep my, my situation, I want to keep the general system running. If a group is a, a dominant group or a ruling group, we would expect them to have more of what uh, people value in a society. And certainly this uh, upper social class we've been talking about has more wealth, it has more income, uh, it certainly has access to the best, best education and health care and so on. So on all the measures of who benefits, uh, I think there's, that shows that they are a ruling class. I also think that if we look at the history of any politician, any politician in America that rises to the very top, that what we find is that at a certain point in their career, they become very involved with uh, the people that we're talking about here. Uh, and, the, and that the upper class becomes essential to that politician in terms of the financing of his or her campaigns. At the national level, we have a power elite rooted in large corporation. At the local level, we have a growth machine that's rooted in the attempt to increase the value of land. And what they want is growth, uh, and which intensifies the use of their land. The American power structure and ruling class come under intense scrutiny in the second in our two-part series with William Domhoff on Who Rules America, right now on Alternative View. Domhoff is America's foremost expert on the American power structure. He has written many books about it, and we're fortunate to continue our two-part series on Who Rules America right now. If you happen to have missed the first of this series, we'll present to you a few short clips of some of the most salient things that Domhoff had to say. Uh, to see these people as a set of interacting and intermarrying a set of families who have developed a whole set of uh, social institutions that preserve their way of life. And what I found standing behind these individuals, I believe, are Lord, large corporations, large foundations, a series of research institutes, a series of policy discussion groups that make it so that a David Rockefeller uh, is not merely an individual, but is in fact constantly um, involved, whether it's with a bank or his foundation or policy discussion group like the Council on Foreign Relations, and then one begins to see that there's an ongoing institutional structure. And so that even then when David Rockefeller retires, 
you see that the people that now run Chase Manhattan Bank, that now are the directors of the Council on Foreign Relations, continue to be the people that run uh, uh, the country. For instance, under Kennedy, uh, who ran on a, uh, a, a platform of getting the country moving again, uh, we've got to get beyond this stodgy Republican establishment, and so on. And yet, when he was elected, the person he put in charge of Treasury was a man named C. Douglas Dillon, from a man worth several hundred millions of dollars, who from a major investment uh, uh, house in, uh, in New York. When we jump to Jimmy Carter, who was our populist, and uh, Hamilton Jordan uh, assured us that we were going to see new faces. Uh, in fact, the person that we got as our Secretary of Treasury was a man named W. Michael Blumenthal, who was the head of Bendix Corporation, a trustee of the Council on Foreign Relations, a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development, a trustee of Princeton University, uh, and a member of the Trilateral Commission. And he becomes our Secretary of Treasury. Now, Ronald Reagan comes in, and he's going to get rid of the mess in Washington from a neoconservative perspective. But our Secretary of Treasury is a man named Donald Reagan, or was. Uh, it was his first Secretary of Treasury, as you know. And, and Donald Reagan was from Merrill Lynch. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development. He was a trustee of the Business Roundtable. And what I'm saying, of course, with those examples, is that uh, when we look at the cabinet level appointments of the past 40 years, at the least, but we could go back further. But if we look at the last 40 years, that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, whether it's a populist or a neoconservative, whatever particular ticket they run on or ideology they run on in order to attract a coalition of voters, when they turn to the question of governing, when they turn to the question of how are they going to implement a set of policies, they do, as your question uh, suggests, they turn to the same group of people. So there, is, there are a whole set of mechanisms that legitimate some opinions and make other opinions seem far out or not worth studying. Once this policy has been set, that the media will follow up on this and you will not find any discussion on anything on the other side. Mm -hmm. of this yeah. preset agenda by these people you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or if it is discussed, it's highly criticized, but generally it's just ignored. Yeah, right. And it all comes down to the point you've made in your previous book, that it is within this range of opinion, within the ruling class, that we have our democracy. Mm -hmm. Anything outside is delegitimized. Right. Bill Domhoff is a professor of psychology and sociology at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Here's some more background information on him. You may know him by the name of G. William Domhoff from a lot of his books. The first uh, book which he came out with, as far as I know, was C. Wright Mills and the Power Elite. C. Wright Will Mills was the first one to come up with a comprehensive look at power in the United States in 1956. And then uh, Bill's first big book, comprehensive book, was Who Rules America, which has been read by many, many people, and others such as The Bohemian Grove, The Higher Circles, The Powers That Be, and the most recent one, Who Rules America Now? If you want to find out just who does rule America, and it ain't you and I, well, you read, want to read that book. When we talk about whether uh, a group is ruling or not, we have to look at um, three or four uh, indicators of power. One, of course, is we've, we've hit upon when we talked about wealth. Uh, if a group is a, a dominant group or a ruling group, we would expect them to have more of what uh, people value in a society. And certainly this uh, upper social class we've been talking about has more wealth. It has more income. Uh, it certainly has access to the best, best education and health care and so on. So on all the measures of who benefits, uh, I think there's, that shows that they are a ruling class. Because we would all like to be a lot richer. We'd all like to be a lot more secure uh, in our economic circumstance. But I also think that we can show that these people are a ruling class when we look at the kinds of policies that are implemented by the uh, federal government. And these policies range from subsidies for specific corporations and industries, tax breaks, uh, a little shaving on regulations, mm -hmm. and so on, on up to more general policies. Uh, policies that uh, I think basically benefit uh, 
uh, large corporations as a group. And, and that means uh, kinds of, of foreign policies that maximize the possibility of in investment overseas, uh, policies at the uh, uh, domestic level that, uh, that uh, maximize the possibility of, uh, of a tranquil and happy and docile workforce, uh, numerous kinds of policy. I also think that if we look at the history of any politician, any politician in America that rises to the very top, that what we find is that at a certain point in their career, they become very involved with uh, the people that we're talking about here uh, and, that, and that the upper class becomes essential to that politician in terms of the financing of his or her campaigns. And that means things like uh, financing their travel, um, giving them money in advance so they can schedule all their television time, um, giving them the kind of money that uh, allows them to hire experts. And basically then it gives any politician that gives, gets involved with these people a leg up in any particular uh, political race. And these politicians are not going to have uh, a set of, of policy uh, stances that are going to be uh, inimical to, uh, to uh, the uh, ruling group. Jimmy Carter is a perfect example. Jimmy Carter is a fine example. And we could say that he's a nice example in terms of the fact that it was not really until he got to the state level uh, that he got involved with the well-to-do of Atlanta. And, uh, and then some well-to-do people in Atlanta thought that he might be potentially a national level politician and, and got him involved with the Trilateral Commission where he met a lot of people who in turn national uh, uh, elites that uh, gave him a lot of money. But if we look at Nixon, Nixon's another kind of interesting example in that uh, uh, well-to-do Republicans in the uh, Los Angeles area were looking for a candidate to challenge a liberal in Congress. And they interviewed, literally put out uh, the word that they wanted to interview candidates. And they decided on Nixon and they bankrolled Nixon from that point forward. But, but let's take uh, Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey was a liberal person who I think in early parts of his career was not heavily involved with uh, the people I'm talking about. But once he wanted to go beyond the state level, uh, it's real clear in terms of his campaign finance that, uh, that he was involved with a relative handful of people that in 1968, for instance, lent him, 20, 25 people lent him a couple million dollars uh, for his uh, campaign. So, as I say, you can look at the liberals or you can look at Ronald Reagan, you can look at Nixon, you can look at Carter, and as they, uh, when they decide they want to go beyond a local or, or state level milieu, they get involved with, uh, with the people we're talking about. They have to, otherwise they can't, uh, they don't have the financial backing. They money. just don't have the uh, financial uh, backing. It's like thinking of politics as this real high stakes poker game that uh, or you have to have a few million dollars to be, to be in it. And you see, this is where we get back to this question about is there a power structure? Americans are used to thinking, well, if there's a power structure, we wouldn't even be allowed to be in politics. But in America, you're allowed to run for president. You can run for anything you want. There's just one thing. You better have several million dollars or access to people that, that have several million dollars. So you see, we can say on the one hand, well, it's very fair. Anybody can run. But, in fact, not anybody can when you get down to the specifics of the matter. So we have a formally open and liberal system, but in practice, the way things work out is that the rich get richer uh, and they are able to continue a set of policies that, uh, that maximize their advantages. Uh, it's, it is also the case we can see it, we can all name some, that there are elected officials in the United States who are not part of the power elite. And they very often do oppose uh, uh, their positions. So I have no doubt there are pro-labor, there are pro-environmental, there are very liberal elected officials at, at various levels in our society. And that does create then 
real conflict. So that my, my point would be, it's not that there aren't such people there. My point is, they usually lose, just as you say, with, I mean, in effect, if we look at the FCC or if we look at the FTC, if we look at various kinds of attempts to create, for instance, a consumer protection agency with some teeth, OSHA. what happens is OSHA we, OSHA, that, that, we, that we eventually lose. They grind us down. And they grind us down because they have this institutional base behind them. They have more staying power. Uh, and furthermore, eventually, with these liberal elected officials, they constantly run at these people. One of the things that's so interesting to me is to watch the way in which a liberal politician will come to Congress, and if he or she starts to really vote in a way that's constantly annoying to the business community, they will, quote, target that person. They will constantly send a lot of money to candidates that are running against this person in the district. So that keeping the person on the defensive, letting them know that one false step and they're going to eliminate them. So, you see, my view is not of a power structure that's sort of sitting there and it's all signed, sealed, and delivered and never challenged. In America, the power structure is constantly challenged, but it basically constantly wins, except on, you know, occasionally it, it doesn't. But so, so there is real conflict in America, and I, I think your point really brings that out well. And, and uh, I, I think that it's important not to deny that. What but it's important well, to see who wins. That's, a, that's, the, that's the key to this, is that we do have a pluralistic society, but we do not have a pluralistic economic and political structure. I think that's excellent. I think that uh, we, I think we have the uh, paradox over the last 20 years that a lot of the social movements that have happened, a lot of the events, have made in some way, in some ways, this a very open society at the individual, personal uh, kind of level, mm -hmm. and yet, I just continue to believe we have the same corporate power structure. And I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction in terms that, that uh, my access to certain kinds of information, my right to do things as an individual, which is a very important part of liberalism, that that could be increased in the society. And it has been for, for minorities, for women, for gays, for handicapped. Uh, those kinds of liberal individual freedoms could actually be in some way increased, and we could still be relatively powerless. So far you've talked about a cohesion right. within the uh, ruling class, but aren't there significant conflicts mm -hmm. at times? The Vietnam War, for instance, there were two opposing views where people the establishment mm -hmm. took pro and anti-war positions. I think in Reagan's uh, income tax reform, obviously there's no cohesion or they can't come to mm -hmm. agreement. How do you explain conflicts within the ruling class? What are the main divisions, mm -hmm. if any, okay. and what forms do they take? Okay. Once we have set this general kind of framework mm -hmm. that we've been talking about, in which we in effect know that these corporate people feel a lot of commonness, from there we can go on to say that they do argue about various kinds of things and that I do th think that we see some relatively long-lasting kinds of uh, different uh, differences of opinions over uh, specific uh, kinds of, uh, of issues. And you mentioned uh, the uh, division of opinion that developed over the Vietnam War, which I think was, was very real and very important. At the same time, from my point of view, the debate over what to do went on in precisely the organizations we're talking about. That is, put, in, put, put more specifically, um, in the early 60s, I think there was complete consensus in the power elite that it was necessary to go into Vietnam. As the war went uh, more and more badly, uh, real significant difference of opinion developed in the uh, uh, late 60s, particularly in the face of the Tet Offensive. And this manifested itself then in very vehement arguments at a place like the Council on Foreign Relations. And experts came there, for instance, one person, Samuel Huntington from Harvard, and he would say to the discussion groups things like this. He said, look, things have changed. We've got to look at this differently. First of all, there's a Sino-Soviet split. Second, there's no big Communist Party now in Indonesia. That's, that's been wiped out, and that, that's, that makes less of a threat in Southeast Asia uh, in, uh, in general. Uh, thirdly, there hasn't been the spread of the Cuban Revolution in Latin America. Uh, and then fourthly, we're now facing a major ghetto uprising in this country. Real unsettling things are happening. And the peace movement, And too, the peace right. movement is the next thing. Yeah. Faced with this, and given what's, that, that what it's going to cost us to win in Vietnam, 
we should get out of that war gradually. Now, what's interesting is that uh, a set of people that were known around Washington as the wise men. These were people that Johnson brought in once a month. The wise men switched their views on the war. Well, who were, well there were t about a dozen of them. Ten, or tw uh, ten of them, at least, were in this Council on Foreign Relations. Three investment bankers, three corporate lawyers, a couple retired military, all had been in and out of government, in and out of corporations. And they said that they heard all the government officials talk about what was, uh, what the, what was needed after Tet. And they went to Johnson and they said to him, don't send more troops to Vietnam. According to all accounts, he was kind of stunned by this. And one week later, he went on the TV and he announced he would not run for president again. And that was kind of a crucial kind of turning point. A, definitely a division of opinion developed on how to deal with this situation. Uh, and uh, they, turned, they changed their mind. Now, there are also longer lasting kinds of divisions of opinion between people that in terms of the American political, pers American political spectrum that we would call moderate kinds of conservatives. They are either conservative Democrats or moderate Republicans. Their opinions differ from those of very conservative people sometimes called ultra-conservative. The moderate conservatives come, I believe, from the biggest and most international corporations in America, by and large. These corporations are in favor of more and more free trade. They are willing to see some kinds of social welfare policies used. They believe that there is some validity to a Keynesian economics. The ultra-conservative people tend to come from smaller corporations and privately held corporations, that is where the family owns it and the stock is not publicly traded. And they tend to be in very competitive kinds of national markets, that they sell their products in some region of America uh, and aren't trying to get overseas or don't have the money to get overseas. Those people have been historically very isolationist on foreign policy. They have been opposed to the slightest welfare state uh, developments, including Social Security. Um, and these people tend to believe that uh, a deficit in spending is the work of the devil. Uh, also very anti-labor, too. Oh. Against any concessions to labor, whereas the right. more moderates are willing to bring them in, or at least the conservative yeah. labor. Some uh, of them, yeah. So. I think there, I want to say that uh, I think I was a little wrong in uh, some things that I wrote in the, 19, in the early 70s, particularly in 1970. I had, I had, I had, had the understanding from my earlier work that, um, that the m people I've just described as moderates were, were moderates towards unions. They're moderate towards labor in the sense of willing to improve welfare benefits, willing to change things that workers uh, complain about within the factory. But they do not like unions uh, either. In other words, n no part of this power structure likes unions. Um, and the reason we've had unions, I'm convinced, is because of uh, the power of workers in the industries that have unions. One of the things that, uh, that I think is very important to understand about the uh, Reagan administration is that I believe that the kinds of people I've characterized as moderate conservatives are basically the people running that administration. People like George Shultz, like Donald Reagan, like Casper Weinberger, like Baldridge at, uh, uh, Malcolm Baldridge at Commerce. They are basically what I call moderate conservatives. The people in the second and third level positions in the Reagan government are ultra uh, conservatives. But then you say, well, look at the labor policies. The labor policies are very conservative because unions are less powerful now. The moderates like the idea of stomping on these unions, uh, but they couldn't do it in the past. So you couldn't stomp on unions in the Nixon administration, not because Nixon was, was friendly to unions, but because in the face of the unrest in America, his whole appeal was to hard hats. These are the true Americans. He wasn't going to attack unions when uh, he was trying to build them as a base against these awful students who were, were demonstrating. But now we have a different situation that Reagan faces. We have a time of peace and quiescence within our country. Maybe there are people grumbling. There are certainly people become in poor, and I think that's a tragedy. But there's nobody disrupting America. So 
and furthermore, there's no war going on out there somewhere. And furthermore, there is the internationalization of production that has led to an enormous number of jobs going overseas, which has decimated the uh, steel union, the auto union, and some of the other. In that context, you can go get the union. And that's why I think uh, uh, Reagan is doing it. Not because he's more conservative than these previous administrations, but because the situation has changed in such a way it's now possible to go after the union. Would you say also it's because that there is no uh, big union uh, uprising or uh, like there were back in the uh, you know, early 1900s and the 30s? Mm -hmm. and the, the, yeah. the, the labor struggles are essentially, essentially over as far as the labor hierarchy is concerned. Yeah. So they've even brought them into some of these elite organizations that you've been talking about. That's, that's absolutely the trilateral commission. Right. It's absolutely true that the uh, leadership of the AFL CIO is uh, invited to sit on the board of a Rockefeller uh, Foundation, uh, is invited to be in these discussion groups like Trilateral Commission or Council on Foreign Relations. I think that uh, some of that is, uh, is definitely part of the picture. But it's like it's more like once there are unions and we've got to live with them, then we'll talk to these guys. But we're certainly not really accepting them. And if the time comes that we can undercut them further, we sure will. And that, so that shows going on. the flexibility of the ruling class, that if there is ferment from below, if there is a challenge to the system, they will retrench and give a bit so they can maintain their control. But just as soon as the opposition is weak, then they'll push it back and that's and my view forward. about the moderate conservatives that is they they the squeaky wheel gets the grease and when there was a real disruption in american society starting with the civil rights movement then the anti-war movement ghetto uprising they were willing and i mean well, by they were forced to yeah they were forced to then they were willing mm -hmm. to have a family assistance plan for instance mm -hmm. they were willing to see better health care national health care these were actually programs advocated by this organization called the Committee for Economic Development. But when the unrest went away, the policy position of the Committee for Economic Development changed in this much more conservative uh, kind of way. I think it's an important kind of flexibility that means that, there, that the possibility of reform uh, uh, keeps the system stable. You see, what's implied by your comment, which I agree with, or I claim is implied, is that for these people... Well, I got it from your book, anyway. No, so. <laughs> no but the most important issue is, is power, yeah. is control. Yeah, In other words, absolutely. if I'm going to make a few million dollars less for a few years, uh, okay, but I want to keep my, my situation, I want to keep the general system running. You see, in the face of unrest, there is another possibility. You can put all the people in jail. You can repress them. You can do very negative kinds of things. And there are sometimes people that advocate those kinds of solutions. And there are laws in the books which would permit this if the, the government right. decides. But it that doesn't it work very well. I mean, often it, it evokes more unrest, right. more rebellion. It has that possibility. But even in the middle 1930s, and here I'm jumping to a time of, of extreme labor unrest, and perhaps the most militant time that there were, that there was only a short kind of window of opportunity, to use the common parlance, of uh, that when sit-down strikes were legitimate in the minds of most Americans. Within, within a year or so of those sit-down strikes, the uh, public opinion wa was opposed to them. Even in the 1930s, I think that a majority of American people were uh, still rural, small-town workers, uh, lot of the white-collar workers. They were not crazy about uh, the union movement. I think that it cons very conservative con of solutions could have been uh, could have been enacted against the union movement uh, if there had been a different uh, administration, if there had been a, a, a Republican administration, if there had not been Democrat administrations in Michigan and Pennsylvania, I think we would have had uh, continued conflict uh, in in those labor struggles. And I say that in the context of the fact that after uh, U.S. Steel was organized, after General Motors was organized, then they, uh, in the case of the Steel Workers Union, they went into Illinois, Indiana and Ohio to try to organize Little Steel. And they did not succeed. There were many people killed and jailed in Ohio. Every labor organizer that they sent into Ohio was put in a jail well, at one time or another. Yeah. And it was not until World War II under the, when Roosevelt said, we've got to have, we've got to stop this labor strife to fight this war, that those, that those uh, uh, steel companies were organized. And one of them never 
Bill, it seems to follow logically from your analysis of the power structure that the only way that progressive political change and reform can come in the United States is through political struggle from below yep. in which the power structure is forced to make certain concessions mm -hmm. and certain reforms to stop unrest from growing into outright rebellion or revolution right. that they themselves are not so generous right oh, I absolutely or pro labor that. that if you don't have a strong union movement strong social movements and agitation actual struggle for change mm -hmm the power structure is going to rule on unopposed and do more or less what's in their interest, yeah, which is just, often against right. everyone else's No, they're going to continue to, to go through their routines. From a, the way we as sociologists talk, talk about that point is in terms of the question of disrupting people's routines. That is basically a society is organized in a set of institutions and roles in such a way that uh, people can go about their everyday business. What that means in terms of uh, people uh, watching this program, they can get up in the morning and they can go to school, they can look forward to graduating, they can say, okay, I'm, I'm able to get a job, I'll be able to have a family, uh, I'll be able to have my vacations, my weekends. Living in that ordinary life is very compelling. It draws people into those routines. For anything to happen to lead to change, there has to be in some way a disruption of those routines. And I'm using that very generally because if we look at what happened that changed America in the 30s, it was a massive disruption of, of a non-union uh, America by this incredible depression. There was, unions were a very small matter in the 1920s, but when this economic system would no longer work and people were thrown out of their routines, they started to vote, Demo they started to vote and then when they voted, they voted Democrat. They started to organize unions. But it was that disruption and sit-ins. You know, we get very concrete. The, one of the key dramatic elements in the early 1937, right at the start of 1937, was a sit-in in a General Motors factory in Flint, Michigan, which meant the capitalists could not go through their routines. They could not go in and make, get these cars made. And the sit-in movement then flashed across the country in uh, all kinds of other factories. And, and really gave this tremendous impetus to, to the union. But now let's look at the 60s. The 60s led to a lot of changes, not because of labor disruption, not because of economic failure, but first of all, because of the fact that there had been created a small black middle class in the South that wanted to insist that the country live up to its, its liberal uh, values. And how did they do it? They did it at the key point by disrupting people's routines. They sat down in lunch counters and said, we will not move. We shall not be moved. And that sit-in movement once again spread to buses, to, to all kinds of, of, of facilities where people sat in, and they disrupted the lives of these people. They could not, in Birmingham, for instance, they boycott the downtown. They marched through the downtown. Now, no longer can you just go downtown and shop. Can you go to your office? You've got to worry something's going to happen. The anti-war movement did the same thing. The anti-war movement disrupted the routines of administrators, of faculty, indeed of, of the likes of Secretary of Defense McNamara. He could not go to Harvard and collect his honorary degree because there were people <laughs> out in the streets protesting, uh, jostling his car, hissing and booing, and so on. That is what makes things happen. Now, I'm not advocating by this, say, for instance, violence. I'm, I'm describing. And I happen to believe personally that the best kinds of disruptions are nonviolent direct action. But I'm saying, but stepping back from you know, my advocacy there, again, into the role of describer or analyst, is what I'm saying is that when we do see change, what we see is in some way people's routines have been disrupted. And what will cause that is economic dislocation, wars. Uh, sometimes it'll be some kind of an accident that will disrupt people's routines, a, a major oil spill, a major radiation or a accident. a nuclear accident right. like we're seeing now in the Soviet yeah. Union may force people. Right, it forces people out of their routines and, and also in the face of these accidents, what happens that's very interesting in terms of our normal everyday beliefs is that an accident makes it very hard to manage the news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, tremendous amount of what comes across the media is when uh, a spokesperson for the State Department or the President or whatever stands up at this carefully staged press conference and tells us what's happening or is going to happen. 
the corporation releases a, a, a statement saying we're now going to build this kind of car or whatever. In the face of an accident, they can't sort of get their viewpoint, they can't get their line together, and often will unravel for them, and we get a very revealing picture then of, of a power structure in the face of a break in routine. And of course, Watergate was a nice example of that. And finally, we end up, of all things, with the tapes of Richard Nixon's conversations in the White House. Now, that was over an accident. When a man that wasn't supposed to be arrested was arrested, you lie about it, you don't have your story real straight, and that leads to another thing, and it just kept unraveling in this wonderful kind of, in that case, it was a disruption in their, their levels. Right. And it spread in a way that then gave us this incredible uh, information about how the power structure operated. Another uh, example of the way in which we've, we've uh, in disruption is important, but also we learned uh, much about the power structure involves um, Daniel Ellsberg, who was a, a policy analyst for the Defense Department and uh, had worked for a think tank called the Rand Corporation, and had often been an advisor to major policy makers at these discussion groups. Ellsberg was from a, a union family but had uh, gone on to go to Harvard and become this big expert. But in the face of the anti-war movement, it rekindled in him, he, he reported, his feelings of, of, his, of his background. And he decided that the war was so wrong that he was going to uh, reveal the origins of this war by uh, uh, putting the Pentagon Papers out in the general public. And so, in a word, we learned this amazing detail of of the fact that uh, of how of how the whole war policy was made of the fact that they were saying one thing and doing another in other words they knew the problems they were going to have winning that war at the very time they were saying it was going to be a lead pipe cinch so but ellsberg just wasn't somebody that suddenly decided to give these papers out it was only the disruption in the society that gradually got to him in terms of kind of stripping away the veneer that he had learned that made him then re-identify with people of, of, uh, that were struggling in the, in the society. So accidents, scandals, uh, break routines, and major social disruptions uh, like a civil rights movement or a ghetto uprising which involves a massive movement of black people from, from uh, uh, south to north. That's one of the largest migrations of a people in, in history in such a short time and that unsettles uh, a, a social system. Here are people that were basically rural people and farm people all of a sudden in inner cities in another atmosphere namely in the north and that was a disruption of those cities, partly, mostly because, of course, the white people didn't like it, and then there was all the white flight. At any rate, that's what then creates the opportunities for people to to uh, do battle with this with these power structures. And in that context, the moderate conservatives are willing to bend. Uh, and uh, and in that sense, we get reforms in our uh, system, which may be lost later which very definitely can be lost later, and that's the, uh, and, uh, uh, the, the kind of the story of what's happened with the Reagan years. That is, the disruption is gone, patriotism is back, there's no wars. And in that context, uh, the conservatives then all of a sudden talk about how, well, these were just liberal experiences, just experiments. These were just a bunch of intellectuals trying out ideas. In other words, they totally ignore the fact that, uh, that these things were all done in the face of real, real pressure. And they are, of course, trying to undercut all those programs. Let's turn now to the local level. What okay. is the difference between the power structure on the local and the national level and the differences between the possibilities for individual participation mm -hmm. and impact locally mm -hmm. and nationally? Okay. I think that local power structures are rooted not in large corporations that produce a product, which is, which is where the national power structure is rooted, but rather local power structures are, in, are rooted in real estate, in land, in development. At the local level, we have what uh, we like to call a growth machine. At the national level, we have a power elite rooted in large corporations. At the local level, we have a growth machine that's rooted in the attempt to increase the value of land. And what they want is growth, uh, and which intensifies the use of their land. Now. That means then that we have to look at a complex of landowners, uh, developers, real estate salespeople, and so on, and mortgage banks, savings and loans tied around, around development. That's what happens at the local level. All of the key issues to a local power structure are the water board, the parking and transportation board, the planning board, the zoning board. That's 
the real politics for uh, local power structure. The other issues are for them uh, symbolic, some of the things that concern other citizens. But, but the local power structure is concerned with, with uh, uh, growth. Now, the, the local power structure does relate to the national power structure in a very important way. And that is that what a local power structure tries to do is to attract national capital. That is, they try to prepare the land, their area, so it will be attractive to the new building, the new high-rise building that General Motors wants to put up somewhere. So we try to, as a local city, they try to say, look, we have the cheapest land that you could want. We have a very nice and docile labor force. We have low taxes. So all these local growth machines compete with each other to try to get the General Motors factory, the Exxon office building, or more generally, the new campus of the University of Texas. They try to get the new, um, new Defense Department installation. Because if you bring one of those major capital kinds of structures into your city, it will mean new jobs for people. It will mean then more money, more spending for the local retailers, and you will then your land will be valuable because now the local retailer is making more money, so you can charge him more rent on the building that you've you've rented it. So I think that's really important to understand that that um, uh, the 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 land-based nature of local power structures. Uh, versus this more capital-based nature, of, totally capital-based nature of, of the national power structure. I've just then suggested that there's a lot of commonality between them, that they, that they have reasons to work together. But you also must understand that there's tensions between them because if, say, the labor force becomes very radical in a given city, General Motors might say, okay, we're leaving. We're going overseas or we're going to Tennessee. And that, at that point, they can leave behind a broken local growth machine. So the local growth machine often finds itself angry with national level capital when it leaves. So there's tension between them as well, as well as cooperation. Now, it's also important to understand that at the local level, the primary tension is created between the growth machine as it attempts to expand and the rest of the people who are trying to live their lives in their neighborhoods. At the national level, we have a lot of conflict between the owners of corporations and other people as workers. As workers, we want more wages, which of course, from the capitalist point of view, is inflationary. We want uh, various kinds of benefits, which from their point of view might make us lazy and not work as hard, and so on. So we have a capital labor tension in national politics that underlies a lot of the fights over welfare and inflation and so on. But at the local level, the fight is between a growth machine and the rest of us who, as neighbors, as, as living in a neighborhood, the growth machine's tendency is to move out and move into neighborhoods, either to put in office buildings or to put in uh, uh, apartment buildings. That is, say you're living in this nice, wonderful neighborhood, you've bought this house, all the people have these you know, single family dwellings, and in comes the growth machine because there's more people now, and they can make more money if they put a big apartment building in the middle of your little area, and you don't like that. The constant fight is between then the growth machine and neighborhoods, and that really animates city politics. Now, this, this conflict can be very liberal, or it can be very reactionary. That is, that sometimes neighborhoods are protecting themselves from toxic waste, from tremendous overcrowding, and a liberal person can certainly understand that and identify with that kind of, with the neighbors in that conflict. But other times, the conflict is such that it's very reactionary because the neighbors are trying to keep out minority people. Or they are, in essence, saying, uh, we don't want uh, a more dense zoning because we like having our two-acre lot. But by having a two-acre lot, they're making uh, housing prices more expensive for everybody in the city. So, uh, in other words, you can't then find enough land to, to build houses for, for, for people of more average income. So, what I'm, what I'm then saying is that you have to look at this constant conflict between a growth machine and neighborhoods but at the same time, you don't necessarily say one side is going to be, more, or that the neighborhoods are going to be progressive. Now, 
what then happens in local politics is that some neighborhood issue will come up. That is, in some way, the growth machine will encroach upon a neighborhood. They're going to put a bigger freeway in. They're going to put a high-rise in. They're going to put a factory that belches smoke into the neighborhood in. One of those, they're going to put a noisy installation in. The neighborhood will be incredibly galvanized. It will fight. But once the fight is over in their neighborhood, they tend to lapse back into their ordinary routines. And of course, in terms of something I said earlier, you can now see my generalization about disruption. Mm -hmm. People go into action when their routines are disrupted. And if I live in this nice idyllic neighborhood and now there's going to be this smelly smokestack plant or this noisy uh, office building or a big freeway right near my house, you've disrupted what I see as my routine existence, you see. Or you've now overcrowded this school or for some people you put minority kids in this school by building this new neighborhood, you've disrupted what I saw as my way of life and I become an activist at the neighborhood level. But once my neighborhood is taken care of, I tend to lapse back into quietude once again. So in a city at different times we'll see different neighborhoods uh, in action. Meanwhile the uh, structures and organizations, institutions of the local power structure remain intact and remain in basic control. Right. And they are, they're usually, of course, rooted in the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. uh, but there's usually some watchdog tax organization. There's also some uh, real estate association. There's also at the national level, incidentally, an organization called the Urban Land Institute that does the think tanking mm -hmm. for these local uh, growth machines. Um, these local growth machines um, have committees of the Chamber of Commerce that parallel the government committees. That is, for instance, for the Planning Commission, there's also a committee of the Chamber of Commerce that looks at planning. So they have a whole parallel structure the, to go alongside the government. And usually what happens then, incidentally, is that a person is legitimated as a, a city leader by being a president of the chamber, by being the head of its uh, planning committee, and then that person then runs, then, excuse me, that person then gets appointed to the Planning Commission. Then after he or she has been on the planning commission for a while, which then legitimates them as a city servant, they then run for city government. In one city in uh, Northern California, uh, in a larger study that was done by political scientists of 10 or 15 Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area city, they had the most wonderful process. I mean, these people had such a lock on the whole thing, it was outrageous. And that, the way it worked was, you'd appoint the person to the planning commission, Midway, and then, you, of course, you had your people on the city council. Midway through the person on the city council's second term, it was a two-term limit in that city, midway through the person's second term, they would resign. And the person from the planning commission would be appointed by the rest of the city council to the city council. That person would then, two years later, run as an incumbent uh, for the next term. And then, of course, do his resignation after he won his second election two years. So, so you had a process then that everybody that was running was always an incumbent by means of, of appointment. But you can see the process from you're a local growth machine member, you get involved in the chamber committee, you get appointed to the planning commission, and then you run for city council. That's sort of the ideal career from the local the power structure. Santa Cruz, though, yeah, where that's... you live, have a progressive city council. How were people able to counter this sort of machine or power structure politics? Uh, they seem to have been level. able to maintain it a while. Right. Too. They have been, and, and, but the important thing to understand is um, that where there have been successful challenges to the growth machine, there has been very great environmental concern coupled with, usually, student politics. That is, when the University of California was brought to Santa Cruz by the growth machine as the perfect complement to the tourism industry, Santa Cruz is on the uh, wonderful, beautiful beach, and its main, main thing for the growth machine is tourism, which means it doesn't want any dirty industry spoiling it. But the university was a clean industry, uh, high level, you know, springing in students, you get that state budget. It was a great coup for that local growth machine to get UC Santa Cruz. Okay. Um, and, it, and also, furthermore, the university runs in the winter, and tourism tends to run in the summer. It was perfect. <laughs> but... The university was put inside the city limits uh, for water hookups and other minor kind of reasons. But the university is a giant Trojan horse inside the growth machine <laughs> because once this 18-year-old vote was put in, the growth machine does not want a single battle 
in Santa Cruz. They wanted to expand northward on the coast with a big freeway, and, and they would have taken in uh, huge ranch lands that would have become 40, 50,000 people. It's all going to be park. They wanted to expand their, their amusement area on a beautiful piece of land. It was stopped by the environmentalists in the city plus the student vote. So I, I think that the answer in Santa Barbara, in Santa Cruz, in Davis, California with progressive governments is a uh, 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 student vote. But right over the hill from where I live is Palo Alto, California. And in that particular city, the growth machine has also been stopped uh, in good measure. But there you have to understand that the people stopped, that, that it was a suburban town and the people who live in that town are well-to-do people, and it's their neighborhood. And they're not, they fought off the growth machine in that town by getting experts to do a study which showed that the developable land, which was on these, these foothills, that that land, that it was actually cheaper for the city to buy that land and put it in preserve than to pay for all of the um, infrastructure that would be needed to develop that land. You see, the standard line of the growth machine is that it's very good to have development because it will create more jobs and bring in more taxes. When you do a cost-benefit analysis, it often is the case, but not necessarily always, that it costs more to bring in this new growth to ordinary citizens than they really do uh, get out of it. Um, so in some places, the growth machine has been stopped. There's also a wonderful a kind of, um, uh, if I may use the word, a dialectic that goes on between the growth machine and a neighborhood, because the growth machine will create a new community. And they'll build all these houses, and the people will be very happy, and everything's lovely. But as you get more and more people in the city, at a certain point, the, the very city you've created as a developer rises up and says, you are going to spoil what you originally promised if you bring more people. And then all of a sudden there's a vote against the developers, and they are stopped. Uh, so that kind of conflict happened. Progressive governments, now I want to say one other thing related to this growth machine business that, that, that's outside of a city level, and it, it shows how, how, how um, different the disruptions can be. Santa Monica, California also has a very progressive government. What happened there was, it was a, it was a city of little uh, single dwellings, very nice little city on the coast, had some well to do, but it, it was a lot of it was middle class. A new freeway was developed in the late 60s, I believe it was, called the Santa Monica Freeway. And what that freeway did was make it possible to, uh, for Santa Monica now to be a bedroom community for lots more of L.A., which was a very attractive possibility because of smog. That meant that the land in L.A., in Santa Monica, was now tremendously more valuable if you put high-rises on it. So Santa Monica was dramatically transformed into this uh, community of these huge... Uh, uh, apartments. Now, once you have these people in these apartments, then of course you want to charge them maximum rent. And in the context of the 70s, their rents were going up like crazy. And, and some of these people were retired people, and they were middle middle level people. What happened was that some progressive people moved to that city, and they said the sensible issue to organize this city around is rent control. And they went out and ran a rent control initiative. Now, the first time they lost, but then something called Proposition 13 happened in California that uh, controlled uh, property taxes. Part of winning that, part of the, the growth machines in California winning that Proposition 13 was to promise their renters that, that they wouldn't raise their rents because now property taxes would be lower. But in fact, rents went up the following year in Santa Monica and the progressive uh, politicians and, uh, went back at, at another growth, uh, uh, rent control initiative and this time they won overwhelmingly, plus their candidates won for, for city council. But the politics of, of Santa Monica have to be understood in terms of, of a very dramatically, rapidly changing uh, situation for the growth machine in which it had, it had fan realized fantastic values thanks to this freeway, put up all of these apartment buildings, but once they started to really raise the rents on these people, the people rebelled through rent control. So rent control became the device through which the growth, the, the growth machine was again, controlled. Again, disruption, off. struggle, et cetera. And then yeah. we see the power structure moving in again with a media blitz in right. later campaigns, putting a lot of money right. in getting some of these progressives um, yeah. out.
Some so of them, it's but a constant they, sort of struggle. Right. And in the case of Santa Monica, where I think the uh, progressive uh, politicians were very far-sighted, very clever about this, and under, had, had the kind of theory we're talking about that allowed them to anticipate, they said, where are these, these growth machine people going to strike back at us? They said, they're going to strike back on us, talking about crime, about more police and so on. So the next program that the progressives developed was one around a progressive way of dealing with the question of crime and and uh, uh, prevention of crime and so on, and in essence, what they did was to take away every issue that the uh, the growth machine tried to use to beat them. At a certain point, what happened in Santa Monica that again shows this flexibility is that the developers would come to them and say, "Okay, we want to develop a certain things. What do you want?" And they'd say. Well, we'll let you build a building here if you put a park over here, if you put childcare over here, right. and if you put some low-income housing over here, we'll let you develop it. So the big developers would cost it out, and they'd say, okay. The smaller developers would say, it's blackmail. It's blackmail. They were, oh, they were angry. But you know what? Today, I, I just read this in the last month or two in uh, uh, New York Times, 60, 70 percent of of American cities are now doing that very kinds of quote blackmail with developers. They're saying, you're going to develop, okay, you're going to pay for the school, you're going to pay for the new roads, you're going to put a park over here, you're going to put some low income housing over here. I wonder if Austin's doing this uh, yet. Yeah. No, no, we aren't that progressive. Maybe yeah. we have a lesson to learn from yeah, this. Yeah, that's the way, I mean, the developers will accommodate to that. Uh, see, the, the, here's the dynamic of America. The power, because of our history and our ideology, the way the economic system works, Tremendous amount of power is lo lodged then in this, these private economic institutions. Developers, landed interests at the local level, capital, big corporations at the national level. The only thing that other people can do is to gain some measure of political power that forces these economic powers to, in some way, uh, accommodate. When you have, in Santa Cruz, you see, mm -hmm. where, where uh, progressive and liberal people have political power, what they use that for is to then make trades with these business people to, to bring amenities to the cities. Just recently, the two sides cut a deal in which the, um, the downtown business community and the tourism industry agreed to accept with, with no fight an amusement tax. But that amusement tax is going to be used to fund social services in Santa Cruz that would probably be lost if these Reagan cutbacks mm -hmm. Uh, go through the ones that are currently being debated uh, um, in Congress and certainly were eliminated Reagan proposed getting rid of all these uh, support services so we we're able to be able to get these social kinds of services and as I say you can allow them to build certain kinds of things if they'll do it in an environmentally sound way and if they'll also build other kinds of things and so you have this irony of where we're getting sort of public amenities but not through taxation, which, which our ideology in America generally is such that it's very hard then to, to, to tax anybody, including these people, and, and to go after taxing them, taxing them directly, they can often then use that against you. But if you say, we'll let you develop this if you give us the following amenities, it works. Hmm. Well, Bill, uh, you've got a lecture coming up here in a few minutes at the okay. University of Texas. We want to thank you for it. Well, it's my pleasure. I've Incredibly enjoyed it greatly. Time. It's uh, been a lot of fun. And it seems to me that the, the basic to a lot of what you were saying all the way through is that we do have an American power structure, but the people have to struggle and organize yeah. and demand and put pressure on it because otherwise yeah. well, it's liable to do a job on it. Americans are all liberals in a classic sense, whether they think of themselves as Republicans or Democrats. And we have to constantly build on that liberal tradition, use that liberal tradition, and use it against uh, 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 the, the power structure. Um, it's, 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 it's part of our culture. There's a history of activism at various levels of our country. There's America's basically, if I put it this way in closing, America's a conservative country with a liberal ideology in which, at various times, we get these chances and uh, what you have to do is make hay when those chances come like in the 30s or, or, or like in the uh, 60s uh, and I, I think it'll come around again and then the trick is to be there uh, basically demanding as much democracy as much civil liberty uh, uh, as you possibly can all of which are perfectly legitimate things to ask for in the United States of America and that's alternative views for this time Glad you could join us again. 
We'd like to thank our camera person, Eric Eubank, our audio man, Kevin L. West, and of course, Austin Community Television, ACTV. Bye.